Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous Sunday afternoon here in the end times in the all is well South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Sunday, May 18th, 2014. I have been at a wedding all day at a Mexican restaurant. That's a whole nother story. So I'm just now getting up on my rock at five o'clock in the afternoon to bring you this week's Doomsday Sermon. This is old Preacher Hambone up on his rocky pulpit bringing you his Doomsday Sermon where I share with you the latest Bible of the Apocalypse that I have found right here in the Austin Library, spelling out what is going on on this planet and what the only thing to do about the situation going on on this planet. This is from my fellow doomsday prophet and environmental alarmist and certainly the chronicler of the downfall of global industrial civilization, a fellow named Lindsey Grant. I believe I've had sermons by Lindsey before. He's the head honcho at that group called NPG negative population growth. And this little book, 67 page book, takes you about one hour to read, it's three chapters, it gets right to the point, the collapsing bubble, growth and fossil energy, talking about the word growth, meaning purely in human population numbers, and in economic growth and how both of those are 100 percent dependent on fossil fuel energy and roughly just uh, to summarize this book he's basically making the same point that i've made how many times from this rock that as we confront the end of the fossil fuel powered global industrial economy, it doesn't matter whether we, A, you are right, we pull our heads out of our asses and voluntarily get ourselves off of fossil fuels, which will never happen, B, whether the, the scenario of peak oil you know how that one goes, whether it plays out or whether we simply burn ourselves into oblivion uh, by our refusal to stop fossil fuels. Whichever way it plays out, the age of fossil fuels is done with. We are in a collapsing bubble as we need to be and we need to face this as a global industrial society and as a species. And basically there's two ways to do this. There's the way that 98% of the people on the planet, including most mainstream environmentalists, are doing is scratching their heads to figure out from the supply side with all of these head up their ass techno-utopian uh, dreams of this renewable energy and all of this unadulterated horseshit, how we're going to supply all of this energy to billions and billions and billions more people on this planet using more and more and more energy. So while 98, I would say probably 99% of people are working to do that, about 1% of the people on the planet, including Hamlin Littletail and Lindsey Grant, are suggesting, guys, there is another way. We confront the oncoming energy crisis on this planet, not through the supply side, but through the demand side, lowering demand on this planet for its energy by reducing the population of planet Earth down to a population where we can survive and thrive and prosper as a human race with the amount of energy that this planet 
can provide to it to us like this planet did just fine for whether you call it 200,000 years or 2 million years as humans when our numbers were below 1 billion well below 1 billion uh, there was enough energy without fossil fuels to supply the energy to power our species for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And so anyway, and I applaud Lindsey Grant for coming to this brilliant conclusion how we do this. Now, of course, we just need to figure out how to get our numbers down through a voluntary family planning birth control. Anywho, that's what this little 67 page book is about. I could sit here and just read you the whole book in an hour, but I'm going to read you, oh, maybe a third of it. I'm just going to go through the, uh, this chapter by chapter. Chapter one, the new American century question mark. That would be the 21st century. This book was written in 2005 nine years ago. Okay, and I'm just going to stab around, go through the book. <clears throat> the neoconservatives and everybody else have belatedly learned that petroleum is indeed finite and that we are running out of it. The Iraq invasion bears all the marks of a deliberate and failed policy to take political control of a country in the middle of the oil patch so as to assure our future oil supplies. If free trade and investment are a mask for taking control of the resources we want, that is exactly what free trade and investment are, it will encounter mounting resistance from others. Okay, taken together, the assertion of our moral rectitude, our right to impose our values, meaning American values, on the world, the desirability of continuing growth, growth is good, Growth is good, and our right to support that growth with access to other people's resources constitutes a sweeping assertion of our rights and power that seems a bit ambitious for a country with annual budgetary and foreign trade deficits of about $500 billion. Foreigners are financing that trade deficit and buying out of our and buying out our businesses while net US capital investments abroad decline dramatically. But there are bigger problems than that. In this book, I will argue that the coming century is more likely to be a debacle than an American hegemony unless we curb our spendthrift ways, stop and reverse U.S. population growth, and help others to control their populations. Okay, moving ahead, talking about capitalism. <clears throat> Capitalism is uniquely the system for the entrepreneur, the risk taker, the business adventurer. It serves the successful. Conventional current economics is grounded in the expectation of endless growth, economic growth for more profits, population growth for more markets and cheap labor. This is why all of that horse shit about the New World Order's depopulation agenda is unadulterated horse shit. The New World Order needs 
population growth on this planet for more markets for their planet eating products and cheap labor for their factories. The economists, other myths and simplifications, economic man, infinite substitutability, cooperative advantage, free trade and investment all justify the freedom of action of the corporation. And then he goes on with that rant. Okay, now moving on to the mighty engine with no brakes. Okay, in the 20th century, modern medicine and public health programs lowered mortality in the poorer countries and modern agriculture fed those rising numbers, but too, too little was done too late to lower fertility. Can you say Sub-Saharan Africa? That created a fundamental demographic imbalance. The resulting population growth has dwarfed all previous human experience. World population quadrupled in one century, a change so astonishing that it has altered or should have altered our assumptions as to the human connection with the rest of the planet. Are we plunging toward a collapse because of that very success? Philosophers since John Stuart Mill have warned against the illusion of perpetual growth. Endlessly growing numbers cannot enjoy endlessly growing consumption. There is a mathematical platitude that post-Keynesian economists ignore. Material growth at some point becomes a logical impossibility on a finite planet. Herman Daly, considered a renegade by conventional economists, makes a point his colleagues ignore. The economy is a subset of the environment. It is not independent of it. The earth is not simply a source of resources and a sink for the waste products, meaning the principal products of economic activity. It is, meaning the earth, is the matrix that sustains life, including human life, and we must ask whether human economic activity is degrading that matrix, that matrix that sustains life. 200 years ago, Thomas Malthus worried about how many people the earth could support, but he did not ask the next question. What will increasing human numbers do to the earth? In 1864, George Perkins Marsh was the first to systematically address that question. Science has been describing those impacts ever since. In 1992, the presidents of the U.S. National Academy of Science and the British Royal Society adopted a joint statement later adopted by the world's major national scientific societies that stated, quote, if current predictions of population growth prove accurate and patterns of human activity on the planet remain unchanged. Science and technology may not be able to prevent either irreversible degradation of the environment or continued poverty for much of the world. If expanding populations and growing consumption impose unbearable strains on the ecosystems that support us, we must learn to identify the turning point and ask 
what population is sustainable? Of course, guys, we've been through this and how many rants? Nobody has an answer to that question. The literature challenging growth mania has itself been growing, documenting the charge that the benefits of growth have gone to the entrepreneurs rather to, than to the mass of working people and that the growth of the human economic enterprise has run down the natural capital of the earth. The toads are joining me in my rant. Mainstream economics has ignored that literature. In the pursuit of growth, it has brushed aside every doubt. And then he talks about the enthusiasm for, uh, for fighting popular. Yeah, you're, you're right. Okay. What about maximum population? <clears throat> maximum population maximum population is simply an estimate of how many people can be supported at a given time. Sustainable population is the population that can be supported indefinitely without the ability, without degrading the ability of the ecosystem to support it. Optimum population extends that idea. It undertakes to describe a population level that could live a comfortable life within those resource and environmental constraints. It is the antithesis of current economic goals, but it should be congenial with the economic aspirations of everyone but the greedy. And it is a vision of a future without the threat of collapse. Uh, moving along. Arable acreage is now declining and topsoils are eroding as a result of population growth and urban sprawl. Arable land per capita has declined since 1970 by one third. And, uh, but our rapid popul our rapid growth narrows the advantage they're talking about. What, what he's talking about here is how the U.S. is feeding the world, but if things keep going the way they're going, we're not going to have enough food to feed ourselves in a few uh, years, much less feed the rest of the planet. And who else is competing for our arable land? Don't forget the chemical industry. Good Lord, an irrigated land now produces 40% of the world's crops, but salinization is lowering yields in perhaps one third of world irrigated cropland. We're all, we've heard about the ramping up water wars on this planet. And modern agriculture is itself destructive. The world now uses about six times as much commercial fertilizer as it did in 1950 and 25 times as much chemical pesticide. Monocultures and high yielding green revolution crops demand more water and more pesticides. It is a squirrel cage. I, I, I love it, a squirrel cage. Okay, the urban, now he's going from, now talking about the rise of mega cities on this planet. The urban population in the less developed world was 300 million people in 1950. By 2000, it had reached two billion propelled largely by desperate peasants moving to cities to stay alive. 
water supplies, sewage services, and electric supplies have lagged far behind, and it is remarkable that the crowded slums have not generated more epidemics than they have. And now they're talking about the urban population reaching 4 billion people in the next 15 years. And the growth of cities and growing water shortages in the less developed countries with disastrous health effects. Oh, it would be a happier world with fewer chemicals and better water. Do you think so? Growth apologists look for panaceas. They suggest oil sands and shales, but processing them is environmentally destructive and may demand more energy than they would yield. Ocean methane is suggested, but the environmental consequences of that could be frightening. Uh, yes, it could. <clears throat> the world is headed into an energy transition probably toward a mix of coal, nuclear, and more benign renewable power. The right costs and dislocations will threaten the world's economies. A saner U.S. policy would stop the effort to monopolize other countries' oil supplies and instead look toward reducing our demand for petroleum and gas. We must phase out our current waste and more Fundamentally, we must stop and reverse current population growth. A smaller population would make the energy transition easier, but demographics move slowly. What about social equity in human numbers? China and India explicitly seek to raise their per capita income to the present average level in the industrial world and most poor nations would probably agree. The effort to get rich has created horrendous pollution problems in China. If the poor countries are to get as rich as they hope without increasing gross world economic activity and further damaging the world's envi environment, world population would have to be not much over one billion. Oh boy, and I'm only on page eight and uh, he's talking about the bottom line what these three chapters are actually three former papers uh, gathered together into one book so the book's a little bit disjointed um, I, I could read this whole bottom uh, bottom line here for this one uh, but good lord I can see that this rant could easily take an hour okay my fe this is talking about the US my fellow writers on optimum population would probably agree that for the United States optimum population may be something like the number we passed around 1950 which would be 150 million people. It is much harder to put a number on optimum world population because an outsider can hardly determine what consumption level might seem comfortable for the billions of people who are presently at or close to the margin of survival. 
And uh, so, you know, we, we've been through this. Uh, okay, and just, and just talking about just the impossibility of, uh, of all this. Okay, one more paragraph and we'll move on to chapter two. The world is tending to divide itself into two different demographic regions. In one of them, there is a real option of consciously managing population levels, but a need to define optimum population as a social goal and to enlist young women's participation in pursuing that goal. goal. In the other, population growth is on a path that will stop and turn around only through catastrophe, hunger, and rising mortality. Okay, chapter two. How long the twilight? I'm just going, I think, to read the uh, first page of this. And then, well, in, anyway, let me just charge on ahead. How long the twilight? This country and the world are in for profound change as the petroleum boom winds down. I find that even specialists in the fields that will be most affected have not seriously considered what that translation will be, what that transition will be like, or how they will handle it. In this chapter, I will examine the period of decline of petroleum and gas, which will be swift. The petroleum era has been a brief spike that has contributed to a quadrupling of world and U.S. population and rising consumption levels. We are entering an age of overshoot. There may be opportunities for an orderly withdrawal if we are wise enough to manage the environmental threats and unlearn the faith in growth that has developed in the fossil fuel area. There will be disasters if we do not. And we're looking forward to a much more speculative future beyond fossil fuels, which suggests that current populations cannot be supported without them. We may come to see the industrial age as the most intense human disturbance of our natural support systems in history. With the judicious employment of the technologies we have learned and with a bit of luck, we may be able to create a more harmonious balance with the rest of the biosphere, but only at much lower population levels and less consumptive habits. Our political and business leaders seem generally oblivious to the unique character of the fossil fuel age. They consider growth the natural and desirable order of affairs and call for more of it, an outlook influenced more by greed than reflection. When warned of the brevity of the fossil area, era and the dangers it is creating, they defend the status quo or, when pressed, offer simplistic panaceas such as the hope that hydrogen or wind and solar energy will solve our problems. They will not. And uh, I'll be talking about this in 
future rants and he breaks a lot of this down uh, talking about uh, how anybody who thinks uh, that we're going to replace fossil fuels with, with, with all of these uh, horseshit renewable energies. Few of our political leaders seem to recognize that the decline of petroleum is a new and fundamental issue. The U.S. government seems to be mesmerized or in denial and state and local governments continue to plan for growth and more traffic as though there were no energy crisis ahead. We may stay in that state of mind and stumble into disaster. More likely, we will search for every possible source of alternative energy, but without addressing the population growth that drives the problem. And then the search for alternatives talking about unconventional oil, meaning the tar sands and the oil shales and the making gas out of coal. And of course, reliance on coal and oil sands is a dangerous course. Aside from the greenhouse gases and atmospheric pollution, coal mining always disturbs the land, strip mining, which sometimes involves cutting the tops off of mountains, is the most destructive, and efforts to enforce restoration of the land, you know, are, are, are horseshit. Now remember, guys, that this book was written as 2005, uh, so this was right at the dawn of the fracking age. He was just getting a whisper of fracking, and of course, Fukushima had not happened. And so then, of course, he goes from the, uh, he starts talking about energy, the environment, and global warming. And remember, guys, you got to go back. This is actually 10 years ago when he was compiling this research. So as of 10 years ago, uh, looking at uh, the, the CO2 levels. The numbers suggest a dire conclusion. We are in overshoot mode, not just because the fossil fuels are running down, but because of what they are doing to the environment and the climate by extracting carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur from the lithosphere and injecting them into the atmosphere and biosphere, we are embarked upon a fundamental alteration of our own habitat. And I think we've uh, had enough climate change rants. Okay. What can we do about the environmental threats and expectations of climate warming? The only reasonable ways are to one, minimize the threats we can manage, and two, slow down the rate of emissions by reducing demand of fossil fuels. That second policy is a powerful argument for a deliberate policy of reversing human population growth. It offers the hope, and I the only hope, he didn't use the word only, that was my, my word, it offers the hope of escaping the penalties of fossil fuels even though there will be tremendous problems of adjustment. And I love this talking about using gas as a transitional fuel. Most of us use the word transitional to speak of the pending energy shift. 
the word transitional implies a bridge from one state to another. Usually, when building a bridge, the engineers understand the nature of the terrain at both ends. In the energy transition, however, we are proposing to build a bridge into a void. We don't know what lies at the other end. Okay, now we are at chapter three, Twilight or Dawn. <clears throat> the fossil fuel era has been a brief spike that generated an unsustainable growth in population and in the industrial world consumption. We are entering an age of overshoot. Humankind may have time for an orderly withdrawal if we have the wisdom to face the change squarely. And that was chapter two. And in chapter three, he looks at our much more uncertain future beyond fossil fuels. Okay, many studies have undertaken to describe how benign renewables might replace fossil fuels. A few studies have noted that population growth makes that task more difficult. Almost none of them turn the issue around and make the point that only a smaller population will make it possible. That is the central point I hope to make. Once we have left the comforting but dangerous shelter of fossil fuels, we will necessarily turn to biomass, wind, solar energy, and more exotic sources. And I do not have time to break this down. Uh, all, all of those sources. Getting back to the bottom line, demographics is the key in the U.S. and elsewhere. A world of half the present, at this point 6.4 billion, now 7.2 billion, could release a quarter of arable land to biomass energy production and still have 50 percent more land per capita for food production. If we have the population again to 1.6 billion, roughly back to the 1900 level, there would be ample land for food and energy production. We would be better off than in 1900 because we have learned better ways of using that land and water. One can understand the near desperation with which people look toward wind, solar, and hydrogen giving, given the limits on those fuels, but wishing is not enough. Pull your head out of your ass if you think this crap is going to save this planet. Experts are still addressing the effort to preserve the present energy supply at prices not too far above present levels. That probably is not an option in coming decades and it will not be an option in the post-fossil area. Future societies may have to adapt to accommodate periodic and unpredictable blackouts and sustained shortages in long, cloudy, and windless periods. I bet that's the least of their problem. Let me inject a brief aphorism. Solutions beget problems. The human race will face an entirely new set of issues. How will our economies be transformed when almost all future energy is electricity? 
Will the gap between the haves and have nots intensify because poor nations and people will not be partners in that extraordinarily complex technology? Will the human race in its hubris be able to restrain its enthusiasm for cheap power? If it does not, we will drive our numbers and consumption to levels that imperil us because of the other penalties of growth. Will we imperil the other creatures on a shared planet and eventually our own survival? Talking about lifestyles is always tricky terrain. It can lead to maundering generalizations about good old days, but I am serious in suggesting that we will need to adjust our goals to seek a simpler and less energy dependent pattern of living. There we go. Uh, what does this mean for transportation and communication? The energy transition will profoundly change transportation and the way we live. There are now more private vehicles than adult humans in the United States. Energy costs will drive us back to public transports airplanes will begin to disappear because no fuel substitute is as cheap and energetic as petroleum. Shipment by sea uh, will regain the competitive advantage it had 150 years ago. Half of ocean shipping tonnage now is used to ship petroleum and that will stop. The limits on renewable energy will force a return to more local patterns of living, working, and shopping. Then uh, talking about its uh, higher energy costs and shifting sources will drive wholesale adjustments in the economy. Um, consumption and equity. Okay, an effort by the rich countries to maintain present production patterns and even more the vision of growth as a solution will be suicidal. The United States is regularly criticized for its high consumption levels, but that particular criticism will take care of itself. High energy prices will lead to lower material standards of living. And we're talking about income differentials that in the past were tolerable may become the stuff of class warfare in the 20th century and he wraps it up with the solution on the demand side. <coughs> Talking about the the little man, uh, little cartoon man with his little placard reading, repent for the end is near. From time to time, I think of that little guy and ask myself, is that me? Meaning that little guy, the end is near. On reflection, I assure myself that my concerns are real. Even prophets are occasionally right. The scientists who are worried are the ones who present the weight of evidence and their opponents generally resort to mantras of faith such as they'll find more resources or the market will adjust or science will find a solution. I don't believe them. Population growth 
set the scene for the overshoot scenario and a reversal of that growth will be necessary to get us out of it. We cannot go back to the renewable energy economy of 1900 without a much smaller population. That reversal reversal will be voluntary and manageable if we are wise and catastrophic if we are not. Getting to the final page. Uh, we need a consensus that population must come down plus the political will and social will to act. I wonder whether our modern individualistic society can act in so cohesive a fashion. The fossil fuel bubble was a durable one and unlike soap bubbles, it will collapse slowly. That gives the world, this was written nine years ago, that gives the world some time to make the one real accommodation that will provide a smooth transition to the leaner times ahead. A deliberate policy of negative population growth. I do not mean to understand the difficulties nation by nation of learning to manage population size to maximize human welfare or the potential for conflict as different nations move at different rates toward sustainable population levels or the tensions created as crowded nations eye each other, each eye other nations' land, water, and resources. I would not bet that the human race can manage this most difficult of transitions, our retreat from overshoot without turmoil, but we have an opportunity to try. Yeah, right. So I guess that is his hope. The last uh, we have, we have an six words of hope. That is his Hollywood ending. Voluntarily manage our retreat from overshoot my ass but I have heard reports of the planet eaters invading South Austin, Texas. I need to get on my gas sucking bike and bring you an on the ground review of the end times headlines unfolding in South Austin, Texas on this gorgeous Sunday afternoon for this uh, doomsday sermon. Amen, Brother Lindsey Grant for your spot-on Bible of the Apocalypse, the collapsing bubble, growth, and fossil energy. I'm turning over the creek to the toads to take over the ranting for the next 12 hours. Bye, guys. Yes brother toad up there in his little pool